I really like using my iPad as a client to remotely access my other machines, whether it's my Linux development workstation, one of my collection of old Macs, or one of my many, many Raspberry Pis, I can access them all from the iPad using the Secure Shell Protocol, or SSH. SSH provides a secure channel for two machines to talk to each other. The machine being accessed is often called the host or the server, and the machine doing the accessing is usually referred to as the client. Using the SSH channel, you can send commands from the client to the host, you can transfer files backwards and forwards, and you can even jump onto other hosts, all from that one client. In this video, I'll run you through the setup I have on my iPad, and most of the setup I have on my hosts. Now I say most, because this video ended up being really long, so I have a follow-up video where I'm going to talk about an amazing piece of software called Tmux that you should have on all your hosts, and I also have another video coming up with a list of my favorite CLI tools that you should install on your hosts. If you're a regular SSH user, you won't want to miss out on those videos so make sure you're subscribed. So I suspect the default way that most people will access one device from another is using a remote desktop technology, something like VNC or maybe Microsoft's RDP. This provides a full graphical environment that's pretty much like sitting at the machine you're accessing. However, remote desktop does have its drawbacks. Firstly, it doesn't work so well over slow or unreliable connections, so it's not as great for traveling. Secondly, it does require that the machine you're accessing has a graphical user interface, so it's not so useful when accessing server type machines. And lastly, it's not as usable on smaller form factor devices like the 11 inch iPad that I use. For these reasons, I prefer to use SSH as my primary mechanism for connecting to a remote host. To use the iPad as an SSH client, you'll need an SSH client app, and you're a bit spoiled for choice when it comes to SSH apps on the iPad. I've used Blink, Termius, Shellfish, and A-Shell, all are great choices, but I've settled on Blink as my default client. I really think you can choose whichever client you prefer, but I do think you should choose a client that supports Mosh, which we'll hear a bit more about later on. Blink, Termius, and Shellfish all support Mosh. Depending on the machine that you're accessing, you might need to enable the SSH server software. You'll also need to get hold of the host name and the username and password that you'll use to connect. On the Mac, open up System Preferences, come to the sharing section and make sure that the remote login option is checked. The host name you use to access the machine is shown here and you can change that using the edit button. You use your standard username and password to log in over SSH. For Linux machines, you'll probably find that SSH is already enabled. If you're coming to this video from one of my Raspberry Pi videos, then check out the link above to see how to set up a Raspberry Pi with SSH enabled. On the Pi, you can determine the host name with hostname CTL, and you'll also use the username and password you set up during installation to log in with SSH. SSH does work on Windows, but the experience is quite a bit different. I'll link to a guide in the description below that shows you how to configure the SSH server software, but just know that most of the commands and most of the setup you see in this video will not apply on Windows by default. So let's dive in by establishing our first connection from the iPad to a host. I have a freshly installed Raspberry Pi. The host name is testpi.local. The username is pi, and I've just set a dummy password. So on the iPad, I'm gonna open up Blink, and to log in, I'll type in ssh space pi at testpi.local, and press enter. There's a space after ssh, so make sure you don't miss that. Then the username, followed by the at sign, followed by the host name. If this is the first time you're connecting to the machine, you'll be asked to trust the key, so press yes for that and then type in your password, and we're in. On a small screen like this, the first thing I like to do is to clear it, and we can check that everything is running. Press enter if you see it go away. And we can just run some quick commands to check everything's there. Who am I? And we're up and running. Having to type in the full host name, username, and password each time gets a bit repetitive. Thankfully, most SSH clients provide a way to create like an alias that has all this information packaged in, and you just use the alias. Let's see how to do that in Blink. To create an alias in Blink, we need to bring up the config settings and we can use the config command for that, but it doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work here is that we're still connected to the Pi. So we're sending a command from the iPad to the Pi. We need to send this command locally to Blink, not to our host. And we can do that one of two ways. We can either type exit here and disconnect from the session, or we can press command T to bring up a new tab. And this is a local Blink tab. And you know that because it has the Blink prompt here. So I'm gonna just use this one press config and this now brings up the settings window come into hosts press add new host my alias will be test pi the host name is test pi.local i'll leave the port the same the username is pi and i won't specify anything for the password just yet we're going to handle the password a different way if i press save click out of that and now if i run ssh test pi i don't have to specify the user or the host name but i do have to pass, pass in my password and i'm back in so let's now turn our attention to dealing with the password issue. And to do this, we're going to configure key-based logins. With a key-based login, you create a public and private key pair. 
the public key gets sent to the host and the private key stays with the client. And then when you log in, you use the keys, not a password. And the complexity of the keys makes them quite a bit more secure than passwords. Small caveat though, you do need to keep your private key safe. And thankfully on the Blink and on the iPad, if you have a secure enclave, there's a way of storing that key in the enclave, which does keep it very, very safe. Enabling key-based login with Blink is really easy. So the first thing we'll do is exit this session. We're going to run config to bring up the config tab and we're gonna press keys and certificates. I haven't got any keys because I cleared everything out before the video. Press plus to create a new one and we'll choose generate new in SE. SE here is secure enclave. If you don't have the option on your iPad, just choose generate new, but know that you probably have to take a few more steps to secure your private key. So generate new in SE. What do we call it? We'll call it test pi or test key rather and click create. So now the key exists and we're gonna go back to settings, come to the hosts, come to test pi and where it says key here, we'll choose test key. And if we press save and come out of here, Let's try logging in again, SSH test pi, and we're still prompted for the password. And the reason for this is we actually need to send the public key to the host. It doesn't know anything about it yet, so we need to make it, make it go there. So to do that, I'm just gonna come out of that, and we use the ssh-copy-id command, which requires an identity file, that's the name of the key, and then the host we're gonna send it to. So we can do ssh-copy-id, test key was the name I used, and test pi is the alias of the host that we set up. Press enter. If you get to a screen where it doesn't look like anything's happened, it's because the, there's a prompt here sort of in the middle of this text. If you press enter again, it'll kind of ask you to type in yes or no. So type in yes. You need to type in your password one more time. Okay, that's all copied. And now SSH test pi gets us in immediately. No username, no password, no need to remember the full host name. Now, enabling key-based login doesn't actually disable password-based login. You need to do that yourself. This step is entirely optional, but I like to do it for all my machines and I'll show you how to do it. Now, the exact steps will differ depending on your machine, but essentially what we're going to do is edit uh, using sudo, sudo nano is the text editor, etc, ssh, sshd config. That file might be in a different place on your machine, but that's a, quite a common location. And in here, we're just gonna type in under include, password, authentication, no. And we'll write that out with control O and control X to exit. Now, when we reboot the machine and start it again, we won't be able to use the password to log in. Make sure you have a copy of your key before you do this, because if you have no password enabled and you lose the key, you will not have SSH access at all. Blink offers a really nice set of cosmetic customizations available from the appearance section in settings. Let's take a look. So config to bring up the settings, come down to appearance, and I've already imported the, the Dracula theme, so we'll start with the themes, and that is not a theme that's included by default. Let me show you how I added that. So if you come to add new theme here and press open gallery, then what you'll find is this list of themes in this folder here. And there's a great many of them, and you can actually get a preview of them all on this main page here. Um, but I know that I want the Dracula one, so we'll come to the themes folder. I'm gonna search for Dracula. There it is. Click on the link, press raw to bring up just the file content, and then I want to copy the content of the address bar. Command L takes us to the address bar and highlights all the, co all the content, and then Command C copies it. Come back to Blink, enter the address here, Give it a name, Dracula 2. So we've already got it installed, Dracula 2. And then press import, press save. And now we've got another theme here, Dracula 2. There are so many themes in that themes folder, it's worth spending half an hour browsing them until you find the one that you really like. Just a quick note that cosmetic changes won't immediately apply to your current tab. And I'll show you what I mean. So if I switch my theme to say Monokai Light, which is this one up here, my tab hasn't changed. I need to create a new tab to see that. I'm gonna switch that back to Dracula because that's my preference. So appearance and then Dracula. Again, it didn't take effect, but coming out and running a new tab gets me back to the theme that I wanted. When you're working in the shell on your host, there are quite a few useful keyboard shortcuts that can make your life significantly easier. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm connected here to my Pi and the first shortcut I want to show you is to cycle backwards and forwards through the command history. And you can use control P to go to the previous command and control N to go forwards in the history to the next command. I find that very, very useful. If I bring up a long command like this one, say, I can go 
backwards in this line with control B for backwards and control F for forwards. So I'm moving backwards and forwards. Control L will clear the screen and control R allows you to actually search through the command history. So we did run clear before and there we go. Control is such a commonly used shortcut key, yet it's weirdly small and awkwardly located on most keyboards. And prime real estate is given over to the essentially useless caps lock key. I, on every machine that I can, will remap caps lock to be control. And on the iPad, I'll show you how to do that. So from the iPad settings under general, come to keyboard and then come to hardware keyboard. And what you're gonna do is click on the modify keys thing down here and change caps lock key to be control. So anytime you press caps lock now, you're actually pressing control. While I'm here, I also like to change the original control key to be escape. Escape is super useful in the shell, especially if you're like a Vim user or something, and having a hardware remapped escape is very, very useful. These mappings are global, so apply to all apps in iOS, and I found them to be super useful. You can also remap keys directly in Blink, and you can remap more keys than are available through the settings in iOS. This feature does occasionally break because the Blink developers are kind of playing cat and mouse with Apple, but it is useful to remap a few other keys. Let's see how. So back in Blink, bring up the config, come to keyboard and come down to custom presses. And here, what I want to do is map the section key, which on my magic keyboard is where the escape key really should be. I want to map that to escape. So press add shortcut, press the section key and you should see it pop up in the combination window here. And then in action, choose escape, which is the circle and arrow icon there. And now we've got escape in a more intuitive area of the keyboard when working in Blink. The control as escape shortcut we made earlier will still work and that will always work even if the Blink developers are losing the game of cat and mouse, but normally you'll find the section key works as escape. In addition to the control prefix shortcuts, there are some useful option prefix shortcuts. Let me show you. So if I have hello there in the, in the command here, I can go forwards and backwards one word at a time using option B for backwards and option F for forwards. This will not work by default though. You need to tell Blink that you want this to happen. So come into config, come to keyboard again, come to option, and then under the section that says as modifier, choose ESC. This means that when you're holding down option, it's actually sending the escape key and that makes those shortcut works properly. Let's now turn our attention to session reliability. SSH sessions don't survive connectivity interruption very well. In most cases, they just tend to hang. And I find that on the iPad, I get session interruption because of the aggressive backgrounding or because the connection I'm on is just not reliable. To get around this, you can lay a mosh on top of SSH. And mosh sessions survive termination. They survive switching Wi-Fi networks. They survive poor cellular connectivity. I use my iPad on the train a lot, always in and out of connection. And the mosh sessions survive that just no problem. You install Mosh on the host, and it's pretty simple to do so. On Linux, you'll most likely find Mosh as a package in your package manager. For example, on Raspberry Pi OS, you can just run sudo apt install Mosh, and you get Mosh. On Mac, the best option is to use Homebrew, and if you're not already using Homebrew, check out my video above on how to get started. And with Homebrew installed, it's enough to just run brew install Mosh. Mosh doesn't really require any kind of configuration. All we need to do is just run Mosh, and then our test pi alias, instead of SSH and our test pi alias, and we're connected. When you're connected over SSH, the shell is the program that is running the commands that you send to the host. And there are a bunch of options for which shell to use. And I like to standardize on using ZSH everywhere. This is the standard shell on Mac now, and I like to install it on all my Linux machines. You can check which shell you're running with the command echo dollar shell like that. And you can see here, we're actually running bin bash. So we're not running SSH on this Raspberry Pi. So we need to install it. As with most Linux distributions, ZSH is available in the package manager. So sudo apt install ZSH. Yes, to confirm. Okay, so now we've got ZSH installed. We need to tell the Pi we want to use that as our default shell. So let's find out where it's installed with which ZSH. So it's in slash user slash bin slash ZSH. And now we can run chush for change shell dash S and then the path user bin ZSH. Type in our password and we've now changed to ZSH. With ZSH installed and configured, I now like to install Starship to get a fancy looking prompt. I used to do this by hand, but it's just too much effort and Starship is great out of the box. On Mac, you can install Starship from Homebrew with just brew install Starship. And on Linux, you need to get the install script from the website, let me show you how. So come to the Starship website, starship.rs, getting started. Come to installation and then choose Linux here. I'm going to copy this command and you can press this little clipboard icon at the side here to copy it. Come back to Blink 
And then on the host, run that command. Go through the wizard. And there we go, it's installed. It doesn't configure itself inside Z Shell automatically. We need to do that. So what I'll do is come back to the website and collapse that. And we can come to ZSH, Z Shell down here and get the little bit of config that we need, copy that. And then in our home directory, we're going to run nano.zshrc. That's the config file for ZSH. And we'll just paste that little bit of Starship config in there and then control O to write that out and control X to exit. And it doesn't take effect immediately. We need to create a new shell so we can just run ZSH. And there we are, we're in a brand new ZSH shell with the fancy uh, prompt and showing the directory and so forth. If you're not familiar with the kind of things you can do with prompt customization, here's an example of Starship showing the details of a Node.js project directly in the prompt. You can see information from the Git version control software, which version of Node.js my project is running. And out of the box, you get this kind of information for pretty much every mainstream language. So with SSH and ZShell installed and configured, we have a really nice SSH setup. I do think it makes sense to now install Tmux into this to get a much nicer experience for longer lived sessions, perhaps sessions that have a few windows open. And I'm gonna cover that in my next video. I also think it makes sense to install a few common command line utilities just to make the experience a little bit nicer than the out of the box one. And I have another video coming up on that as well. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on this content. Other than that, let me just say, I hope you found this video useful. If so, please hit like, it does help the channel and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.